This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. Try and picture the oldest building you can. Maybe it's Ireland's Newgrange, maybe it's the pyramids at Giza. Whatever it is, I want you to take that image and try to really imagine how long it's been standing for. The vast gulf of human life separating you from that building's creation many eons ago. Maybe you just managed to glimpse a fragment of that eternity, to briefly sense the impossible timescales involved. Well, try and hold on to that feeling while you can. Because today's geographics will make even that temporal chasm seem like the merest sidewalk crack. Out on the Finnish island of Olkiluoto sits a site with an existentially terrifying claim to fame. Known as Onkolo, it's destined to become the longest standing structure in human history. A nuclear waste repository, Onkolo is intended to last 100,000 years, nearly 25 times the length of time the pyramids have stood. But how do you build something to last so long? And what mind bending challenges do such timescales create? Today, Geographics is peering into the strange, sublime world of humanity's nuclear tomb. If you were to fly a plane over the island of Olkuluato off the west coast of Finland, chances are you wouldn't notice anything interesting about it. Flat, covered in pine trees, and home to little beyond three power plants, Olkuluato is so outwardly boring that you could almost use it as the base unit for quantifying all other scales of dullness. But look closer, and you might discover that this island isn't quite so boring after all. Deep beneath the earth, 450 meters down in the bedrock, lies one of the most remarkable structures structures on the planet. Known as Onkolo, a Finnish word that can be translated as cavern or hiding place, it's the world's only repository for high-level nuclear waste. Once it finally begins operation, it will be expected to house radioactive leftovers for 100,000 years. To give you some idea of the timescale involved, it's worth going backwards to see what life was like 100 millennia ago. As we set our time-winding machine, you should note this journey might take a while. Even traveling back a year every second, it'll take well over a day to arrive. So make sure you're comfortable. Within a minute of pressing the on button, you zipped back past the 1960s, past the moon landing, the Beatles' free love. Within five minutes, you've crossed the 300-year mark. Outside your window, the nation of America has ceased to exist. George Washington has yet to be born, and Abraham Lincoln looks as crazy futuristic as the president of 2161 would look to you. At 10 minutes, Shakespeare is gone. The Americas have yet to welcome both Christopher Columbus and smallpox, and Europe's main sport is dying horribly of plague. By the time an hour has passed, you're back in the ancient world way before the founding of the Roman Republic. Finally, around the 76th minute, you pass the building of the Great Pyramid at Giza. And you still have over 26 more hours to go. When you at last stepped out of your time machine a day later in 98,000 BC, you'd find Europe frozen in an ice age, sparsely populated by Neanderthals and herds of woolly mammoths. Everything, every single thing you associate with human culture would still be uncountable millennia away from happening. In other words, 100,000 years is a ridiculously long time. But for Onkelo, surviving that long is a necessity. Nuclear waste comes in three different levels, low, intermediate, and high. At the low end, you have stuff like clothing that's been doused in radiation. At the high end, you have the actual spent fuel used in power plants. For humans, coming into contact with high-level waste is about as healthy as snorting a line of anthrax. We measure the effect of gamma rays on the human body in something called sieverts. In a typical year, you or I might receive a dose of two to three millisieverts. And note the milli at the start of that unit, like how a millimeter is way smaller than a meter. Well, spent reactor fuel will douse your body with an entire non-millisievert in less than an hour. When that happens, you can expect symptoms like your hair falling out, vomiting, and our favorite, internal bleeding in the eyes. Within a few weeks, you will be as dead as a Norwegian parrot. Although the level of danger drops exponentially after just a thousand years, it isn't until you hit the 100,000 year mark that this kind of waste is safe for humans to handle. 
Hence Onkalo, hence Finland's need to build an eternal nuclear tomb. But if you think storing this waste is as easy as just digging a hole and declaring mission complete, well, prepare yourself for a shock. From here on out, things are going to get tricky. Given that we've been using nuclear power since the 1950s, you might assume that we have a good handle on how to dispose of its waste. Well, you'd be wrong. Right now, every single nuclear waste producing country on Earth keeps that waste in interim storage facilities. A fancy way of saying nobody has any idea what to do with it. Because this stuff stays dangerous for so long, we have to assume it will outlast all our cultures. And well, that's a massive problem. While it's certainly possible we'll become an intergalactic civilization with technology so advanced disposing of nuclear waste will be child's play, it's also possible some major pandemic or egomaniacal world leader playing with the launch codes will send us back to the Stone Age. That means we have a duty to future Earth civilizations, not just to leave piles of stuff lying around that can make the insides of your eyes bleed. And we mean piles. A century from now, there will be an estimated 1.1 million tons that need disposing of. This simple, terrifying fact has been keeping scientists awake for decades. Since the 1960s, all sorts of methods have been suggested for disposing of high-level waste, from burying it under the ocean floor to blasting it into space. But each keeps looping back to the same problem. How can we guarantee it will remain secure for a length of time far longer than the oldest human civilizations? Especially since, so far, we haven't managed to keep it safe for the lifespan of your average parrot. In 1967, Germany decided to experiment with what's known as geological disposal. With the asphalt mine in Lower Saxony running dry, the government moved thousands of tons of radioactive waste in there, sealed it up, and hoped that they'd never have to think about it again. By 2008, the site was an ecological disaster zone. Thanks to collapsing mine shafts and the decay of barrels holding the material, the mine is now a toxic place. It's thought the waste could potentially come into contact with groundwater in the future, thereby poisoning it, but the costs of cleaning up are so astronomical that it might be impossible. That was just after 40 years. In terms of our time machine analogy, you'd have barely had time to press the on switch and check your phone before you'd passed those four decades. Still, burying nuclear waste remains the favored long-term solution. Only now we're trying to bury it better. At Onkelo, the goal is to store radioactive material behind so many barriers that it's impossible for it to seep out. Each deposit will be made inside a 25-ton cast-iron canister, itself contained inside a thick copper vat designed to stop corrosion, which will then be placed in a chamber carved deep inside the bedrock. Each chamber will be filled with bentonite clay, aka the stuff in kitty litter which will expand and absorb liquids and also cushion the canisters against any geological movements. When Ancalo is full, all 137 tunnels will be refilled and sealed off, hopefully trapping the material forever below the ground. In short, Onkelo is an attempt to do geological disposal right, to build something guaranteed to last 100 millennia. But even if the site itself lasts, how can we keep it safe from excavation by future civilizations? Well, it's time to get into the most fascinating aspect of it all. How to craft a warning that lasts beyond the limits of human imagination. And if you want to craft something that can challenge the limits of human imagination, then it's time to consider turning to today's sponsor, Squarespace. Two simple things. One, maybe you've got some idea for a business or a website that you want to start, or maybe a podcast, a YouTube channel, something like that, knocking around up there in your mind. Well, two, the only way to figure out whether it's worth doing is to get it out there into the world. And of course, this can be daunting because it's scary to go and pursue new things, but knowing how to set up a website is not an excuse. Squarespace allows you to create a powerful website for whatever you're up to. You want to sell something online? Yes. Set up a store. Or you want to do a podcast? Yes. Also available on Squarespace. Or you want to do a YouTube channel? Obviously, you do the YouTube channel on YouTube, but you're going to want a website to complement it. It all starts on Squarespace with a beautiful template that you can customize to your heart's content or start from scratch or move over from an existing domain. It's all super easy. Squarespace also handles all of the websitey stuff. Like I said, they do podcasts, they also do mailing lists, social integrations. It's all there. Like I say, Squarespace, it removes the excuses to your dreams, so just go get started. Plus, there's 24-7 customer support. I mean, you're not going to get stuck. It's really easy. But just in case you do, they are there to help. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash geographics, and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Let's get back to it.
1981, the US Department of Energy convenes the nuclear science equivalent of the Avengers. Known as the Human Interference Task Force, the assembled scholars were tasked with warning the far future about the danger of nuclear waste. To say they had their work cut out for them would be a little like saying the Pope has a certain affinity for the Jesus dude. The most common symbol for radiation is the trefoil, that black dot with the three blades coming off it. Yet surveys show only 6% of all humans understand what it means. That's 6% now. In a few hundred years, it could be 0%, let alone in 100,000 years. In fact, almost any symbol you can think of runs the risk of being massively misunderstood when removed from its cultural context. A pictogram of a healthy human walking up to the radiation source, then falling sick, might be read backwards, suggesting a magical healing device is inside. Even now, many cultures, such as the Japanese, read comics right to left. To counter this, the Human Interference Task Force decided to get creative. The linguist Thomas Seabock suggested founding an atomic priesthood that could pass the knowledge of waste repositories down through the generations via myth and ritual. Not to be outdone, Francoise Bastide and Paolo Fabri proposed genetically engineering cats to change color in the presence of radiation, then instilling generations of youngsters with a fear of color-changing cats. In other words, they came up with ideas as awesome as they were totally useless. Still, they weren't the only ones to try. In 1991, the United States Waste Isolation Pilot Project, or WIPP, took another crack at solving the problem. They recommended the creation of a hostile or poisoned landscape, one that would naturally make humans want to avoid it. For example, the entire grounds might be covered in basalt, creating a black, dead land where nothing will grow. Or jagged spikes might burst through the earth at odd angles dotted with pictures of terrified human faces based on Edward Monk's The Scream. Yet this approach also comes with problems. At the time of recording, WIPP's current plans involve using gigantic 8-meter-high granite columns to mark out the site, followed by rooms buried at different layers explaining the dangers below. But while it might seem logical that future humans would avoid such a place, since when have humans ever been logical? As the late great Terry Pratchett once wrote, if you put a large switch in some cave somewhere with a sign on it saying, end of the world switch, please do not touch, the paint wouldn't even have time to dry. We can see this happening in the real world, even over comparatively short time periods. In Japan, tsunami stones are markers placed at floodwater height that say things like, high dwellings are the peace and harmony of our descendants. Remember the calamity of the great tsunamis. Do not build any homes below this point. Although they've been around for a thousand odd years, most of these still extinct stones date from 1896, when a massive double tsunami killed 22,000. Many of them were well known to townships that were wiped out in the catastrophic 2011 tsunami, and yet they'd chosen to build below the stones. If people can ignore such dire warnings in a little over a century, how the hell can you make sure that anything stays relevant for a thousand times as long? At Ongolo, the answer they eventually came up with was. You can't. So why bother installing any warning at all? In the US, it's a legal obligation for high-level waste repositories to try and notify future generations of their contents. But Finland has no such restrictions, hence the current plan. There's not going to be a marker. There's not going to be a sign. There's no warning there from the past. Instead, there will be just regular terrain, no different from any other part of the island. This isn't as crazy as it might seem. One of the reasons the Finns chose this island, as we mentioned earlier, is because it's unbelievably boring. There are no sources of water, no minerals to be mined, no reason for any future humans to ever move there and start digging around. And that dullness extends underground too. In 1980, 29-year-old Timo Alkas was tasked with finding a long-term safe place for burying Finland's nuclear waste. As a geologist, ICAST knew that the ground under our feet isn't always stable. It moves, it shifts, often slowly, but with enough power to break open any number of nuclear waste containers. What seems like a safe storage place in 2020 can easily become a nightmare danger zone by 102,000 AD. But not Okolotu Island. The rock under Okoluato was formed 1.9 billion years ago and has remained stable ever since. So you know how human timescales seem laughable against the length of time Onkalo will last? Well, the rock beneath Okoluato guffaws at even Onkale's timescale. If he jumps back in our time machine, you'd need to travel backwards at the rate of one year per second for over 60 years 
get back to the point when Okiluato was last geologically active. But while Icas would recognize the brilliance of Okiluato's stability, it would take him two and a half decades to see construction begin. First, it took until 1983 for the Finnish government to officially license the project. Then it was another six years before they passed a law forcing nuclear companies to put aside money for it. It wasn't until 1993 rolled around that serious examination of candidate sites could begin, and an additional seven years before the site was finally chosen. Finally, in 2004, construction began on Ankalo. By that time, Ikers had been working on the project for 24 years. He'd gone from youthful 29-year-old wunderkind to a middle-aged 53-year-old expert. It might have taken less than half a minute in our time machine, a joke compared to the timescales we're discussing today, but for Ikers himself, it represented an entire lifetime. Perhaps the craziest part is that back in 1980, Icas had fully expected there to be plenty of high-level waste repositories all over the world by the time Carlo began construction. The official Finnish position had even been to wait and see how the German, British, and American repositories worked out, and then steal the best bits for their own design. But over that quarter century, all the other projects had collapsed, rendered politically toxic by locals kicking up a storm about living near radioactive sludge. Only in Finland alone, where local communities were not only consulted, but also given a veto over the project was work able to proceed. Ground was broken on the site in 2004, and with that, the fate of Okiriotu Island was sealed for the next 100,000 years. The process of creating Kale was a long and slow one. Excavations were done by drilling holes in the rock face, filling it with explosives, and then blasting chunks away at a time. This was followed by dragging the waste rock away and washing the new walls, sealing them with insulation, and anchoring them with cement bolts and steel bars to stop the whole thing falling down. It was a painfully time-consuming process, explaining why the site still isn't finished even today. The most recent estimate we could find is that things will be ready to start practice runs for handling nuclear waste in 2022, but it may be that the coronavirus has delayed things on that front. Still, the project has already reached its maximum depth of 450 meters. In 2015, the Finnish government granted the license to start building the repository itself, as in the tunnels where the waste will actually be stored. Once completed, they will run in a tangle over 60 to 70 kilometers, all condensed in an area around the size of the nation of Monaco. The plan is to finally start shipping in high-level waste there for disposal in 2024. Once that begins, Carlo will run for the next 100 years. Years. By the time it ceases operations, you, me, and every single person watching this will be dead. Timo Alkas will be a distant memory, as far removed from the men and women working on his project as someone like J.D. Rockefeller is from today. But what will disposing of these spent fuel rods actually involve? Well, the first thing to note is that one simply doesn't just remove a fuel rod and walk it into Oncalo. Each piece of waste that ends up in the tomb will have spent several decades cooling in a pool at an interim storage facility where temperature and radiation levels will slowly decrease. Since these things come out at a staggering 800 degrees Celsius, this is a pretty important step. When enough of these fuel rods are cooled, they'll be bundled together and then placed inside cast iron canisters a meter wide. These canisters, in turn, will be lowered into copper urns five centimeters thick and transported to Ancalo. There, they will be placed in chambers carved from the bedrock and surrounded by bentonite clay. Once the tunnel has all its canisters, it will be refilled with water-absorbing clay blocks and sealed until all 137 tunnels are closed off. By that time, around the year 2125, 3,250 canisters containing 6,500 tons of high-level waste will have been deposited. The main entrance shaft to Nkalo will be filled with rubble and the complex will be sealed. And then the fins will simply walk away. Walk away and wait for trees to grow over the site of the nuclear tomb and for the world to forget that it ever existed. But it's at this point that the story gets really interesting. As the poet Robbie Burns once wrote, the best laid schemes of mice and men go often askew. And while the plans for Onkelo have certainly been well laid, there are already major worries about what the future might bring. Take the thick copper canisters, which the company in charge believes will last 100,000 years. While a 2012 study by the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm concluded that a more realistic time frame might be a mere 1,000 years. Now that's still a long time. Machu Picchu, Beijing's forbidden city, and the entire nation of the USA are yet to last anywhere near that long. 
but it's just a drop in the ocean compared to the 100,000 years that the waste will be dangerous for. So what happens if the canisters degrade? The fear is that water that leaks into the canisters will be transported back up to the surface full of dangerous radionuclides. This could be potentially harmful for any future civilization that just happens to be living there, although Finland disputes the Royal Institute's findings. Far more likely is that the canisters could be ruptured by some force we have no way of preparing against. At some point in the next 50,000 or so years, it's predicted a new ice age will grip the Earth. Icy sheets, many kilometers thick, will come sweeping across the northern hemisphere, burying Europe beneath heavy glaciers. While that makes it even more unlikely that anyone would accidentally stumble across Onkelo, the pressures on the bedrock would be unbelievable. With kilometers of compressed ice weighing down on the tomb for uncountable millennia, who knows what may happen to the chambers that the canisters lie in. Still, those in charge at Onkelo feel confident that even these geological disasters won't breach the tomb. What Timo Aikas imagines happening instead is that the site is simply forgotten about and never again reopened. It could be that when our sun finally becomes a red giant in the next five billion years, extinguishing all remaining life on Earth, Akalo remains undisturbed, a strange relic from a nuclear age our distant descendants have no idea even existed. But who can say for sure? When dealing with the sorts of timescales that Okalo exists on, there's only one certainty, that time will make fools of us all. Most every precaution we as a species can make for the next 100 years will be wrong, let alone the next 1,000. Heck, how many people just 10 years ago could have predicted things like Donald Trump being president? Looking to the future is hard. Well, now try imagining looking 10,000 years into the future, a mere tenth of the time Ancalo is meant to stand for. Try picturing a Mesolithic hunter-gatherer in the Europe of 9800 BC, a guy living in a world before the Bronze or Iron Ages, before Stonehenge or the Pyramids, before the first recognizable civilizations ever arose. Now try imagining that hunter-gatherer sitting down and predicting our time. Try and picture him envisaging the creation of nation-states, of vehicles that can fly through the air, of an invisible net that covers the entire planet, bringing a bald man talking about history to the phone of someone living over 15,000 kilometers away. Can you do it? No, of course you can't. And that impossible stretch of time is just 10% of Ancala's intended lifetime. From the vantage point of our own minuscule, cosmically insignificant lives, then, all we can really say is that Akalo represents a hope. A hope that something from our era will last so long, an anchor to our own world and lives unchanging down the eons. Whether that's possible or whether that's a laughable dream is something none of us will live to find out. Because in the great book titled The History of the Akalo Doom, we haven't even started the first chapter. We haven't even got off the first page. All the twists and turns, all the details, are still to come, and we can only guess at what they might involve. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do smash that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos every single week. Also check out our fantastic sponsor Squarespace. There's a link to them below, and thank you for watching.